Um, I stand before you actually very excited about the, uh, the opportunity. I also stand before you as the head of a company uh, and I want you to imagine that I have investors on my shoulders because I do. And so when I look at the title, the only thing that Peter didn't do was put profitability in red for the purposes of this discussion. Because when you're in, uh, when you're in the entrepreneurial mode, you're in this, uh, this business of uh, ultimately delivering what you believe is, in our case we believe, is something that's fundamentally transformational in the motorcycle industry. There's an awful amount of pressure. And of course we have investors. And as a company, we're very fortunate to have what I think is, uh, I, I could not wish for a, a better set of investors. We happen to have a, a company called Invest, or a private equity firm in New York, managed $4 billion of assets. Uh, but they're investors, and investors expect a return. I do feel for companies that have, uh, and I hope there's no venture people I'm going to upset, but you know, for, for companies who have venture-backed funding, it can be a real challenge because venture capitalists typically have had a much shorter horizon uh, looking at their return. Uh, in our case, we have got some phenomenal investors who are very long-term minded, came out of uh, the strategic consulting world, so I get uh, the advantage of having uh, a group of people on my board who spend an inordinate amount of time with us, helping us with the company strategy, what we're working on, incredibly supportive, but then they'll step to one side and then they'll uh, be very demanding about what we do as a business. So just to be clear, we are a for-profit organization and uh, uh, right now we're not making a profit. So a little bit of history on Zero Motorcycles. Uh, we're a California-based company. Uh, we uh, design all of our motorcycles in California. We assemble the motorcycles in California. We have a f uh, facility here. Our European headquarters is just down the road in Alkmaar, uh, chosen specifically because of the proximity to all of the European countries and Great Port of Rotterdam. Um, you know, I, Paul Scott showed a picture of, uh, of a zero. Paul actually is a zero owner. Uh, he's got another zero on, on order. So I'm very grateful for his uh, uh, leadership um, on the whole issue of plug-in. And you, I thought his speech was uh, absolutely spot on and I was, uh, enjoyed that. Uh, thank you, Kenan, for showing the, the picture of the zero as well. So um, having said all of that, how many people are motorcycle riders in the room? Just a quick show of hands. Oh, excellent. Excellent. How many of you have really wanted to be in the motorcycle business? Oh, really? All right. All right. Just look at this slide. This might deter you from doing that. Right. This actually shows that uh, we entered the motorcycle market at a pretty damn bad time, in theory. We were founded in 2006 and uh, we delivered our first product to market in 2010. Uh, we were very proud of it at the time, however it was not a particularly good vehicle. Uh, it only had a very limited range. Our 11s improved on that, our 12s dramatically improved on that with a range of over 100 miles in the city and the current model range of 13s gives 137 miles in the city but if you go on a freeway at 70 miles an hour you'll get half that. Uh, but um, obviously this did not look too good. You know, it's been in decline since the recession. I, we are starting to see a slight upturn in the North American marketplace, which we're pleased to see. Europe has still uh, been heading in the wrong direction overall. However, when you look at the electric side of this, it's really encouraging. Now, some of these numbers are uh, maybe a bit confusing, but we've taken the European, or we've taken the regions, most of the regions, uh, and put them on the left scale. So you can see how the growth is anticipated over the course of the, the next four years or so, with Western Europe and Eastern Europe combined actually showing uh, great potential, which we're excited about. Um, we show Asia, if you look at Asia, that's the scale on the right. And you'll see that they have had some remarkable growth in, in this year alone. 18 million uh, e-scooters and e-bikes have actually been sold in, in, Asia Pacific, in Asia Pacific, 12 million of those into China alone, at a price point of anywhere between $500 and $600. So very low cost, turns out not to be overly reliable and not great range of performance. But when you go, if anyone's been to China of late, you see them all over the place. 
and they do actually perform the great function of personal mobility within the communities that people lead, uh, live and need to, be, to commute in. So Asia Pacific is by far and away the, uh, uh, the biggest growth. But in the category of motorcycle that we produce, uh, that market is still very small in Asia as well. So what I'm going to do is uh, really talk to you a little bit about this uh, profitability uh, issue. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I spend a good deal of my time with my staff and the board really uh, going over our business model because it really is a business model issue for us. And, it's, it, and if you looked at our business model 12 months ago, it was very much focused on this single element of trying to build a business that we could become profitable on by selling motorcycles to consumers. So a lot of our focus has been on investing in uh, sales organization in North America and in, in, here in Europe. Uh, the idea that we could build out a network of motorcycle dealers like uh, in a traditional manner of delivering uh, motorcycles to market, that we could start to educate those um, uh, dealers on being able to adequately be able to sell and support the vehicles. And it's been a huge, huge challenge. We need Paul Scott in every one of those dealers to do this really, really well. So the, the education gap is a massive problem when you think about these, these uh, motorcycle salespeople are incredibly knowledgeable on internal combustion engine bikes and they can tell you, you know, the difference between a Suzuki, a Yamaha and a Kawasaki and they can switch you from one to another. When somebody comes in to talk about an electric motorcycle and, and has, I, I will absolutely guarantee you, done a tremendous amount of research then they walk into a dealer who doesn't have the, the, the knowledge to be able to fill in the gaps, and it's a disastrous selling experience. So that's been a huge, huge challenge for us, as just being able to think about how do we uh, educate the consumer? How do we step into that in some way, shape, or form to be able to guide a consumer to a point where we can get them to commit to go and get on a motorcycle? Because one of the differences between our motorcycle and a conventional one is that when you get on it, and ask Paul about this, when you get on it, it's an incredibly different experience. No noise, no vibration, no heat, no gears, no clutching. And so when you think about that, and it's quiet, relatively quiet, very different from an experience that most people have when you've got all the vibration, not let alone the emissions that you talked about, Renee. So very, very different experience. But in this particular mode, we're acquiring one customer at a time, one sale at a time. So the cost of customer acquisition is incredibly expensive. And of course, the market is still nascent, still very early. And so we realized last year that if we build a business model around that particular strand alone, uh, we couldn't predict when we we're going to become profitable. So we spent a lot of time really thinking about, well, how do we grow our business and accelerate it really quickly? Um, we had a thesis that our vehicles could be applied into other application areas. And the thesis uh, started really with uh, the police agencies. And we, we, we'd been approached by a couple of distributors internationally who were chasing down deals with their local uh, uh, cities. And they invited us to participate in the bid, which we did. And we, we won a couple of deals. We won a deal in uh, the city of Bogota in Colombia. Uh, and again, back to policy. Policy, very important at the high level. And really, uh, it was the mayor of Bogota who decided to make electric his platform and has decided to basically get all of the uh, combustion engine vehicles, buses, light trucks, cars, and motorcycles off the streets. Heavily congested, uh, 5,000 motorcycles policing the streets of Bogota. And uh, they decided to, 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 they bought 100 of our bikes that are deployed as we speak in one district. And if we are successful with that evaluation uh, over a period of time, then you'll start to see that the remaining 5,000 of the bikes will be replaced over a period of time. And so you can see almost a conveyor belt that helps the predictability from a business point of view of knowing that every year you've got 500 or 1,000 vehicles that's going in a particular location. And Colombia is the, is the leading city, but every other major city in, in, in Colombia has the same basic issues of heavily congested, they use motorcycles for policing, and uh, so we see a huge opportunity in that country alone. 
So for, from a business point of view, if we can sell 100 vehicles at a time as opposed to one at a time, this is a key accelerant to the growth of, of our business and very, very important indeed. And in fact, at the end of uh, this presentation, I'll show you a short video, a two-minute video of uh, a police officer talking about the implementation and the use of a vehicle in his particular area. The third area for us in terms of growing our business, uh, it turns out that with the advent of our model year 13s, we have a very unique powertrain. The combination of a battery, uh, that we, our new battery architecture, uh, the electric motor that we designed, the controller, and all of the software that gets wrapped around it. Uh, we think we have the best electric powertrain in the power sports industry in the equivalent of 600 to 800 cc uh, combustion engine bikes. And uh, we're starting to have conversations now with automotive companies who are looking at micro cars, with other motorcycle companies who have uh, not done what we have done over a six year period, which was invest in this whole technology, this platform. And they're left with the decision of either, you know, if they believe that electric is in the future, what do they do? Do they buy it? and work with somebody like us, or do they go and invest in it and go through all the pain that we've gone through over the last six or seven years to, uh, to, to perfect it for themselves? And so uh, we're, we're enjoying some really interesting conversations that ultimately uh, could help accelerate the growth of our business too. And, and even things like go-karts. It turns out that uh, uh, there's a lot of go-karts around the world, a lot of go indoor tracks that have to be vented. There's a lot of maintenance associated with those machines. And a lot of these companies are very interested in putting uh, electric go-karts on the track and taking the, uh, the combustion engine-based ones off. So a very big, uh, very big deal. So profitability, I, 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 you know, I was listening to Elizabeth this morning when she was talking about the air quality. I can tell you that when it comes to this being a viable business, I wake up every day and I go, okay. Deep breath, smile, and just go at it again, because that's what you have to do. And it feels at times that you get uh, pushed back, uh, but uh, it is, in fact, uh, what, what we have to do. You know, the, the path to profitability, a lot of uh, the dollars that we spend are around shows and events, uh, uh, outreach with the dealers, outreach at the international motorcycle shows, just to be able to get in front of people who are motorcyclist enthusiasts, to be able to educate them on what a, an electric motorcycle is. So many times I've uh, stood there and watched somebody stand and look at a bike. Our bike's downstairs if you haven't had a look at it yet, and they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know what questions to ask. And so there's a whole education process that you have to go through before you get people to feel curious enough to say, you know, I'm about ready now to get on a bike and go try it. So that's our objective in this place, is to, to make sure that we can get people onto a bike. Because once they get on it, and they've been a, a, a combustion engine rider, it's a very different experience. And the grins on people's faces, as Paul will attest, uh, is just remarkable. So our conversion rate off demonstration rides is actually very high. From a business point of view, there's immense, immense pressure on the cost structure of the company. Uh, you know, if you look at the price of our vehicle, fully loaded battery, which has four modules in it, is $16,000. It's not a cheap vehicle, but 50% of the cost of the, uh, of the bomb cost is in the battery alone. Because uh, that's just the nature of uh, where cells are. We have a very different, although we're lithium ion, we have a very different chemistry and we have a very different set of batteries than they're used in a Tesla, you know, who's using standard notebook batteries in the car. Uh, we have to have a different cell chemistry to, to give us the energy density and the power density we need to be competitive in the motorcycle business. So what we're striving to do is try to find ways to get scale or effective scale in partnerships with other companies. And then lastly, we're, we're really looking for the application areas where we can sell tens of vehicles at a time because the return on that is, uh, is obviously tremendous. And the, the best example that we've found, if you like, the first bowling pin that we hope to knock down others is the, uh, the police uh, because they've got, uh, invariably, in most countries, there are green policies. And then you've got to find the cities that are progressive where a mayor is driving um, the, uh, uh, the city to do the right things, and they've got a police chief who's enlightened. So there's a lot of you know, selection that you have to go through in the major metropolitan areas to find the right place to have the right conversations. And it turns out, in the same way as we're talking about the buses, there's a very effective business case for us around the price of our vehicles are very competitive with a fully loaded Harley or BMW in a police environment. Uh, and if you go into the police 
departments, they will tell you to the mile what the difference is in maintenance costs between a Harley Davidson and a BMW. We just had this conversation with the LAPD. They know exactly what their fuel costs are, and they also know that operating, operating costs are under pressure every year. So, so far in the five cases we've just done, we show a significant benefit of using electric vehicles over the life that they need to be used against the maintenance costs and the fuel costs. So I'm gonna close here with uh, a video, two minutes, just to show you um, the police in action. Do I need to do anything to run the video? No, I don't. I guess I'm not going to show you a video. It should be, should be, should be embedded. I am lying to you. I am not going to show you a video. However, if you want to know more about the, the police application, then we can talk downstairs uh, next to the vehicle. So anyway, thank you very much indeed for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed the conference, Peter, and uh, really appreciate it. Thank well, you. thank you so much, Richard.